Hello everyone. Hi. Um, my name is Renia Dejumor and I'm here to just do a quick short session about um, child abuse. I know we are all professionals and practitioners here. And I mean, I'm really grateful for Nursery Show for having me here. And if you've been waiting for a while, I'm really sorry I had to come from London. So it took me a while. Some of you may have come from London, but I think your timekeeping is much better than my one. So thank you, Nursery Show, for having me here. So child abuse, safeguarding, um, child protection, whatever you want to call it, is about protection of children and making sure children are safe, I mean, being kept safe. It's making it simple for us as childcare practitioners. I mean, um, looking at it myself, I realized that so many things have changed. Um, who, if you've been in the childcare profession for 30 years, can I, can you signify by raising your hand? 30 years? More than 30 years, anybody? Maybe you re they're retired now. 25 years? 20 years? Yes? And I'm sure you've noticed that so many changes in childcare. I mean, we didn't know what safeguarding was. No one was talking about safeguarding. I mean, it was all child abuse that they brought in child protection. And now, I mean, the changes is amazing. And there's already been an updated form which the new government has introduced. So we're going to be looking at that. Um, my background, I'm a mother of three, have been in childcare for 15 years now. I have a psychology background. I qualify for my NNEB, so I love children. I mean, that's why I do it. And I run a company called Eden Mobile Fresh, and I also consult for people as well. So today we'll be looking at what is safeguarding and child abuse? Um, what does safeguarding mean to the, to the practitioner, to us as practitioners? What does child abuse mean to parents? Do, do parents think, I mean, Parents, most parents think they don't abuse their children. I mean, it's about discipline and everything. So what does it actually mean to parents? I mean, types and signs of abuse, what the UK and legislation, what, what, what UK and legislation says about child abuse or safeguarding, if there's any form of legislation against child abuse and the roles and responsibility of the practitioner and parent. Okay, child abuse. What is safeguarding and child abuse? And it says, according to the government guidance, working together to safeguard children, this was just been updated in March 2013. So it's been changed from the 2010 and it's been updated. It says, safeguarding is protecting children from maltreatment. Whatever form of maltreatment, whatever form, whatever it is that you think is maltreatment is actually protecting them from it. You might think overfeeding your child is maltreatment. You might think putting a child in front of the TV for such a long time is maltreatment. You might think a child not having a balanced life within home and school might be maltreatment. It might be a child going to school late, I mean, going to school late, also going to bed late, not wake, you know, whatever you think is maltreatment to that child, then that, you know, that is what the government is saying abuse is. It says preventing impairment of children's health and development. Whatever actually stands in the way of helping a child to grow, to develop in whatever shape or form is actually seen as child abuse and safeguarding. So impairment can be, um, let me say, not, not letting the child have a balanced diet. How that might actually affects the child's growth, physical growth. You know, if a child is having too much sweet, I mean, the government are talking about healthy, healthy eating and that kind of thing. It's about of the health of the child, the impairment of a child's growth, the developmental stage. You see, intellectually, are you, um, how are you developing the child intellectually in the sense that, you know, what kind of books, what kind of skills you're helping the child you know, to develop as a practitioner or as a parent. It says ensuring that children grow up in circumstance consistent with the provision of safe and effective care. I mean, it says the provision of safe and effective care. 
we as practitioners, what do we actually provide for children in the settings that is safe and also effective care? What, I mean, are we aware of some eating special needs that a child may have? Are we actually detecting this on time? So it says effective care. Are we looking at the social? I mean, I was reading at, I, I was reading the EYS and I realized they've actually changed it back again to emotional, physical. I mean, it's quite strange that they moved it from where it used to be, they changed it and they've brought it up back again. So, I mean, this is actually saying the effective care we're doing to help with the developmental stages of the children. It says taking action to enable all children have the best outcome, the best outcome in whatever they do, not we thinking about the outcome for them. If a child is good artistically, we need to actually develop this. If a child is good intellectually, you know, some children, they like reading books. It's good. It's the outcome for them. Some children, they love numeracy. Some children, they love literacy. So whatever outcome it is, it's our job to actually help enable the children to grow. Um, child abuse... I, I like saying this, any child under the age of 18, I mean, recently in the news, there was, the, there was a case that was won in the way the police were actually treating children in custody, that they were 17. And I was actually shocked when I realized that, you know, the law says 18, but why are you actually um, treating them at 17 like they're adults? So, I mean, what the law says is child abuse is, any child under the age of 18 that is believed to be at risk or suffering from significant harm, such as physical, emotional, sexual abuse. So, I mean, he, he actually says it. Whatever kind of harm a child is suffering from, that's what child abuse is. Always believed to be at risk. Um, the home office says that one to two children have been killed by their parents and carers, it's quite shocking. But I mean, we see this in the news anyway. We hear about stories every week. You know, one, between one and two child has been killed. One in 10 children has been abused. So in the midst, I mean, if you have 30 children, three children have been abused. In 2011, 600,000 children in England were referred to the local authority who had concerns about them. 600,000, that's a lot. That's a lot to me. I'm really passionate about child abuse. Okay, what does safeguarding mean to the practitioner? We have a duty of care to ensure the uppermost welfare of children by following the requirement of the Early Years Foundation, which was revised in 2012. Some of you may be aware of this and was implemented in 2000, I mean, September as well. There's so many changes. I mean, I do deliver child abuse course. The ones I did, it's actually outdated. When I was doing my research again, I was like, oh my God, I have to keep, you have to keep updating yourself. Some of us that have been here for 30 years, it's like, you're like, what's happening? They keep changing it and, you know, bringing it back. But our job, means that we have a duty of care to em ensure the uppermost welfare of the child by following the EY EYF, Early Years Foundation stage. Ensuring that children learn in a welcoming, stimulating, healthy, safe and secure environment. We do that. Most all professionals are meant to do that. In a welcoming, when the children come in, you're smiling, no matter how tired you are. I run a mobile crash and we never, some of the children, we never see them again. But the joy of it is that they don't want to leave the crash setting. And that's really good for you as a childcare practitioner. The children you might never see again, but for whatever hours, they might be there three, four hours, they're there, they're enjoying, they're, you know, they feel welcome. They might have, I mean, children that are just settling in for the first time, you know, reassuring the parents as well. It's very key as well. Ensuring that individual needs of each child is met. I mean, one of the key things I, I realized from the new, um, the new policy or guidance the government had is 
they're having a person-centered approach. That is, the child is the center of the individual child. So you don't say, I mean, oh, they're three. This child is going to achieve this milestone because they're three. It doesn't matter anymore. It's the child. It's not assuming that, oh, by two, the child is going to be saying some few words. Or by two, or by one and a half. Some children might work at eight months. Some children might work at one and a half. So it's actually having a child-centered approach. Developing positive relationship that will enhance confidence within the child. Relations, I mean, our relationship with the children is what they have outside of the home. Some children might not have that positive relationship. Some of us might impact children for the rest of their life. So our job is to actually develop whatever positive relationship, no matter how, if the child is a crying child, you know, some children are quite tearful. Our job is developing this relationship with them. Being aware of issues for concern in the child's life, you know, home or elsewhere. It's a lot of work, you know. We have, some of us have, you know, key working system. Some of us are in the nursery school. I don't know if some of us are in the primary school. But it's good to, some parents might think you're being nosy, but, you know, find out a bit about what's happening at home because that's what safeguarding is about. Because when we know what's happening at home, we might be able to, some parents are quite close up. So it's actually finding a way to, if the child is too young, goes, what's wrong, you know? Knowing what to say at the right time, you know, getting close to them at the right time. It's not, it's, it, you know, it's not an easy job, but we as professionals, you know, when we're in the setting, we need to put on our professional hat. Yes, is everyone okay? Great. Um, have policies and procedures to safeguard children, which is in line with relevant local safeguarding, you know, the policies and procedures must include action that will be taken in the event of an allegation made against the member of staff. So, you know, cover mobile phones and camera settings. Oh, God. On the news the other day, nursery nurses watching pornography. Come on. On their phones. So, mobile phones and cameras, very important. In the crash iron, I tell none of the staff they're not allowed to take pictures of the children. The manager or the supervisor is the only person because, you know, and even using pictures of children, you need to have ask for consent. So, you know, this is quite important. And showing that there is a lead practitioner for safeguarding and all staff are up to date with policy. So you have one person, which I'm sure most of you are doing, but also that all staff are up to date as well. And showing that suitable person with the right qualification, skills, experience and training, you know, we, you know, NVQ level two, NNEB, some people might have NVQ level two, but they are quite motherly. You know, you put them, if it's a baby, you know, they have patience. It's not about, it's having the right person, the suitable person at that time. Disclose all conviction, cautions, you know, everything has to be disclosed now. It's not just you finding out. Everything has to be disclosed. What does child abuse mean to the parent? I don't know what pe parents think child abuse is. Um, they feel that, you know, disciplining their children, you know, it's okay for parents to discipline their children, but it's crossing the line. That's my, when do they actually cross the line? When do they know they cross the line? Do parents know they cross the line? How dare you, you know, it's my child. I can tell my child, you know, I can, you know, chastise my child. Parents have a right to have set rules and boundaries, but it's them knowing when they actually cross the line of child abuse. You're stupid child, you're so, you're so silly. I mean, I, I don't like it when I see parents swearing in front of children. I think that's wrong. So, but some parents don't see it as being wrong. Emotionally, how does it affect the child? Intellectually, how does it affect the child? I don't, I, I mean, some people might think it's not good. You know, the words you say, 
how do, how do parents actually, what do parents think child abuse is? There are cultural aspects that parents might want to, that, you know, because of a particular culture you come from, but does that mean you are crossing the line? There has to be defined lines. Smacking and hitting a child, there's quite two different. So, you know, it's for parents to, we as pr practitioners, to actually help parents to know, do you know what, I understand you need to have rules and regulations, routine for your children, helping them to become upstanding member of the community, because that's what social and emotional development is about. But we need to have a clear line on what you're actually doing when, you cross, when you're crossing that line. Is everyone okay? Yes? Great? The types and signs of abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, physical abuse, heating, slapping, kicking, punching, throwing, those are physical abuse. Emotional abuse, you're stupid. What do you mean you're going to the library? Who's told you you can actually write a poem? Intellectually, you're actually destroying the child's self-esteem. You know, or even in nurseries, I'm sorry, you know, you can't do that. The child's self-esteem is coming down. The way, what we, what we say as practitioners does influence on children. What we say as parents has more damage on them emotionally. Does anyone agree with me? Emotional development, it's a very, it's not sin. But the way the child, you know, behaves like the world is on him or her, not wanting to socialize, not... So, I mean, I think most of us knows, you know, we know emotional abuse. Sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is forcing a child to have unwanted sex. Even looking at the material as well grooming a child whatever age as long as they're under the age of 18 that's what the law says neglect not giving your child the right food do you think overfeeding your child is neglect does anyone agree or not <laughs> that debate is still on if you think overfeeding your child is neglect or not not letting them go to bed at the right time what do you think do you think that's neglect as well because if the child goes to bed around 12 1 a.m in the morning how do you think they're going to feel in the morning when they come to school i feel you know it's setting rules and boundaries the law and legislation we know that the crb is no more and it's now the dbs Disclosure and Bearing Scheme. And it's actually, you have the one for children and you have the one for adults. So if you're working with children, you don't have to do the one for adults. And if you're working with adults, you don't have to do the one for children. And I was having this conversation with a social worker and I said, okay, if someone that was abusing an adult, how does that work? Do we still allow them to work with children? Or if they were abusing children, do we still allow them to work with adults? So, um, that's something. According to the NSPC, there's no single piece of legislation that covers child protection in the UK. No single one. And that's why they have this, they brought another one, Working Together to Safeguard Children 2013. I mean, it says, um, safeguarding legislation can be found in the Children's Act, 1989-2004, the United Nations Convention for the Rights of Children, so, I mean, you, for you to have an understanding of the, legal, the legalities of child protection and child, you need to read all of this. And I was, I was refreshing myself because I, I, I had an idea of the 2010, but the 2013, refreshing myself again, I was like, oh dear. But it makes it simple, actually. This was quite easy to read. 
it was it was not there was not a lot of jargons in it. It was something that child practitioners understood. So I mean, it's just for you to know that there's no single legislation that actually protects children in the United Kingdom. Okay, roles and responsibility of the practitioner. Safeguarding is everyone's responsibility. The cook, the cleaner, as long as you're in the nursery, everybody, the health visitor, the GP, whoever it is. We're meant to walk to, oh, oh no, it's not my responsibility. No, oh, she's moved on now. She's left her nursery. She's gone to a different school. It's all our responsibility to make it work because 600,000 children in the United Kingdom, every, shall I say every year, I've been, it's important that every professional working with children and, fa and families be aware of their roles that they play. So we as LES professionals, we should be aware of our roles. I mean, I think we are very good at child development. You know, the social worker is good at the legal stuff, the acts, you know the different acts, the sections, I don't know those things, I just know or child development. So everyone should be good at whatever role they do. The role of the parent acts for any help if need. I mean the the sorry, the this working together to safeguard children two thousand and thirteen talked about acting for any help. Parents, some of them is because they don't some of them is like they don't know how to parent themselves. Maybe that's why the child has been neglected. They need parenting skills. They might need some cookery lessons to be able to um, provide, cook healthily for their children. Or maybe they don't have the money to actually buy the nappy for the next one week. So it's for parents to actually ask, sorry, ask for help. Develop an open environment and relationship with your child. Parents, you know, let you, your child come up to you, you know, whatever it is they want to talk about. It's about having an open relationship with them, an environment where they know that, oh, really? Did you do that? You know, the child will be like, okay, I'm not going to tell this woman anymore, regardless of whatever age the child is. Be aware of the developmental changes in your child. It's not about the chronological age or the developmental age. That's what I always focus on. Because a child of three might be very good at reading newspapers. That's just because he's advanced in intellectual skills. A child of four might be because of the dice. Oh, I mean, a child of six might be because he's got dyslexia. That's why he or she cannot read at that time. So for both practitioners and parents, you know, being aware of the developmental changes in the child. Okay. Um, summary. That was quick, wasn't it? We as professionals should put the child's need at the center of our safeguarding policy so that the right care is provided for each individual child. Centered, person-centered approach, child-centered approach. So we need to put the child's need at the center of our safeguarding policy. It's not about what we think, it's about putting herself in the child's shoes, whatever the background of the child, to ensure that the child is safe. A child-centered approach is the key to the safeguarding of children within childcare setting. Every child having their own care plan, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but the key work, the key worker system, actually makes this happen. When you know a staff member has four to five children, they they um, they're very much aware of. They know them. They know them in and out in the nursery. So a a child centered approach, you know, not assuming because you're you're three, you're meant to be doing a certain things. It's the developmental stage rather than the chronological age of the child. Abuse can happen to children regardless of their age, gender, race or ability. And abuse has no discrimination. It doesn't matter if you're upper class, lower class, middle class, white, black, green, orange. Abuse crosses all gender. 
It doesn't matter if you are a TV star, a doctor, a cleaner, it doesn't matter. And we as childcare pr practitioners, is us taking our, our bias away and actually seeing. I mean, cases of Jimmy Savile, the cases of so many, um, so many cases that because we thought, oh, you know, is this person, oh, no, it, it can, you know, she can never do that. Oh, she's the mother of three. How do you mean she's abusing children? So actually, abuse happens to children, it doesn't. The types of abuse, physical, emotional, sexual, and neglect. So we've talked about, um, you know, having the right safeguarding policies, a child-centered approach. We've talked about the types of emotional types of abuse and also remembering that there's no single legislation that covers child protection in the UK. Thank you very much. Any questions? I just think that neglect is one of the hardest areas to define and like you were saying about if a child goes to bed late, is that neglect? Um, I'll give you an example. In, in my setting, there was um, a parent whose little boy had asthma. He didn't need his inhaler very often, but he did sometimes. And one day she said, oh, I forgot to bring it in today. And I'm just wondering, where is that line? Was that neglect, her not bringing that inhaler in? And how do we get that across to parents? Because I don't, I don't think she intentionally would have, you know, abused her son and I think sometimes it is unintentional, they just don't know where that line is. The key aspect is, it's not just one incident, you need to have your evidence. If it's, oh, she's explained herself, when you come into, you know, in more, when you have like the full child abuse, child protection safeguarding, it tells you the signs of, you know, if the mother or the father or the carer is being avoidant or not wanting to discuss about it. So the idea is, I mean, you said it, it wasn't intentional. If she now regularly doesn't bring the inhaler in, then you're like, okay, is there something wrong with that emotionally? You know, is investigating about it and actually taking your evidence down because how would you, what evidence are you going to show to social services or whatever that, do you know what, mother is not actually giving medication to a child because that's a form of neglect as well. But he's actually having the evidence to support it. So, I mean, as you said, she didn't do it intentionally. But you need to have the evidence to actually support you. I mean, an example was... Um, there was a nursery that wanted to find out about neglect. And what they did was, that, I mean, they had to because it was the only evidence they could do. So they wanted to know if the toddler's nappy was being changed, if the child went home. So the last thing they did, they changed the child's nappy, they matched the nappy, and the child went home, and the next day the child would come back with the same nappy. So they actually used that as evidence because neglect is very difficult so is you know they they said okay for us to know for us to have our evidence we'll be marking the nappy and they had the report they had everything and that was how they knew that you know the child was being neglect, neglected by parents um, for me safeguarding is not only for children but also safeguarding yourself and going back to your point um, I think you've got to really safeguard yourself because if that child did have um, yeah, an, attack, yeah. an attack, you would have been the one. So it's okay to say to parents, I think, um, I cannot take on that child until you bring on your bring on the halo because that's very, very key yeah. for me um, and anybody else in this room. So it's about safeguarding yourself. So it's okay to say no. Exactly. And it's about safeguarding yourself because if the child had an attack at that time, what would you do? Oh, you cannot use another medication because that's not right. And so yeah, safeguarding yourself as well professionally because the mother will say, oh, why did you, or the parents, yes. If you've got an initial concern about a child, such as when they feel their nappies not being changed, would you be recording that as in terms of writing it down and not sharing with the parent? or 
you know, as I say, it's just been, always been an issue with us. How do you log those initial concerns? I mean, you know, if you have an out and out concern about a child, you're obviously going to deal with that straight away. But if there's something you're just not sure and you want to almost build that evidence base, how do you keep um, that information? Yes, the thing about it, the, the rule we, we'd say with child protection abuse is as long as you're telling the parents you're not going to put yourself at risk and the child at risk. The pa some parents might be like, oh, you know, some, some of them it might be due to mental health. If, they, if maybe it's just the beginning of mental health or, you know, depression or it's just the sign as well, like they might need it. So you have to weigh it that me telling this parent, is it going to put this child more at risk? Because, you know, the child might have been someone the other local authorities were looking for because maybe they absconded from one local authority to, to, to the other. So you need to wait. And as a manager, you might want to refer it to your local authority safeguarding person before it goes on to, um, to the child protection coordinator or something. So if you, as a manager, you're not sure, then you might want to ask advice from the local... Um, because you need to build up your evidence. But you telling the parents is your way that is it going to put myself and staff at risk and primarily, primarily the child at risk. So that's what you have to weigh. Does that answer the question? <laughs> I'm just an incident. If you have a child that's um, a fairly new child and parents come in and sort of advise you they've had a fractured skull, but they're not willing to share the information um, with you. You know, can you can you insist on them sharing the information? Of what 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 happens? Or you know, it's a, something new to us. We've never had that sort of concern uh, before. Yeah. I mean, fractured skull, the age of the child, so there might there should be a health old, visitor. Yeah, under, so, under a year old. Exactly. Yes. So there should be an health visitor involved. Yes. Because. If the child is, you know, the health visiting team will have the medical report and if the child went to the hospital, they will send it to, I mean, in where I come from, if a child had a fall or something and you went to the hospital, they will actually send you a copy. So there should be the health visitor involved, but you can actually get in contact with the local, your local um, safeguarding team because there's a local safeguarding team as well to get to be sure for yourself. So the te team around the child. Yeah, the, yeah, so the, the, the ring them out, obviously call them and just report. I, no, the thing is, if you if you if you think you're concerned, you no, we're not concerned. But she, she just doesn't want to share the the actual accident. She doesn't actually. But is the child us. wearing something on the head or? The, the child came with the fractured skull. She's just joined the nursery. She's just joined so the she nursery. She didn't have it. She's not. This hasn't happened while she's while. been at the nursery. She just informed us that she had a fractured skull uh, just under twelve weeks ago. And I think for yourself, for your safeguard, share the accident. For your safeguard, you need to see evidence as well, yes. because for your policy to know that the child didn't actually fracture his or her head in your setting. And for, for future purposes as well, you need to tell mom that mom, we're not trying to you know, get into your business or something, but it's the policy of the nursery yes. that we actually have this. Even if it's a copy, you know, a letter from a doctor, something, but as long as it's you know, for your safety, for your safeguarding as well, yes. We have to close it there. Thank you.